Hey, hello. Um, I'm Stephanie Grayson, and I'm going to talk about speciesism today. This is a pretty simple remote. I should be able to make this work. All right, first I'm gonna make clear why speciesism is important. Um, I come from a background in clinical psychology, and my interests are in social psychology rather than strict anthrozoology. Um, in a broad sense, I'm really interested in the psychology of prejudice. What is it? Why does it exist? How does it play out? How is it sustained? Prejudice is an evaluative response to a socially constructed category of beings. And in contemporary semantics, it plays out through isms. Isms indicate a belief in the superiority of one group and policies that serve to that group's advantage. Um, and also working to the disadvantage of other groups that are perceived as inferior. We see this play out all across our social spheres. We see it in racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, ageism, anti-Semitism, classism, you name it. You can kind of add to the list mentally. Um, it plays out all over the place. Now, as somebody interested in psychology, I can't speak for all fields, but I can definitely say very comfortably that psychology has been rapidly progressing in addressing all of these other isms those that were listed, but it's entirely missing the mark when it comes to non-human animals. Why are we becoming increasingly good at exposing prejudice when it's related to humans and not at all when it comes to non-human animals? That's what I'm wondering about. And this is despite the fact that it results in very similar consequences, just for a different group of beings. So a good chunk of the answer, as we've heard from a lot of other people over the course of this conference thus far, lies in history and culture and in the ways that they inform our dominant paradigm, which dictates that animals are distinct from humans in some socially constructed but apparently very, very important ways and um, are therefore less worthy of you fill in the blank. Um, another piece of the answer, I believe, lies in language thought and the ability to know what we're talking about. How frequently do we really hear the word speciesism? We hear about animals, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, superiority, privilege, et cetera, et cetera, but it really sounds like something important when we say racism as opposed to attitudes and behaviors towards racial outgroups. Or say sexism as opposed to beliefs and policies related to the superiority and um, privilege of males over females. So we do have the word speciesism, thanks to Richard Ryder, but how often do we hear the word speciesism outside of this conference? I know for myself, when I bring it up outside of here and um, talk about what I'm doing, people give me just the absolute craziest looks I've ever seen and ask me what it is, and it takes a 15-minute response to sort of try to explain what it is I'm talking about. So if you're familiar with Foucault's philosophical stance on knowledge and language and power, um, you'll kind of know what I'm getting at here. I think the important question to ask at this point related to speciesism is what do we do to increase the perceived level of importance within our dominant cultural ideology to empower the topic of speciesism, like in the, ra in the case of racism and sexism and on and on and on. So I think we use the power of language and thought. We operationalize it. We create an instrument meant to capture speciesism as a specific and measurable construct allowing for wider dissemination of information about it so that it can earn its place up there with the big isms. So that's what I did here. Now the purpose of this study you can see here empirically evaluate the psychological, psychological and behavioral correlates of speciesism, contribute to more of a theoretical understanding of what it is, provide an assessment tool that evaluates people on a continuum rather than in a dichotomous fashion. It's no good to say, you are or aren't speciesist because we all are and it's just a matter of degree. And include speciesism in the realm of research-based dialogue because right now it's purely theory. Um, some loftier hopes for the future, who knows if we'll get there, include evaluating interventions, studying the psychological processes underlying the development of speciesism and preventing speciesist outcomes. I'm particularly interested in youth, so that appeals to me. Um, establishing a better understanding of other forms of prejudice since it's been theoretically linked to other forms of prejudice. I wonder if through research we would find that. Um, and just give us a greater understanding of the way in which people situate themselves relative to others. For this study, we've got some really important terms. So speciesism, um, most of you probably know, but some might not. 
Um, and this study was operationalized through scores on my speciesism scale. That was the instrument that was developed. And it was defined as attitudes and behaviors that grant human superiority and privilege over any non-human animals. An animal um, not distinct from human was defined as any member of the biological kingdom animalia. Human, any member of the taxonomic category homo sapiens within the kingdom animalia. And a non-human animal, any member of the kingdom animalia who's not a homo sapien. So um, we have some incredible research on very similar and related constructs. They overlap a lot, and they're very important in understanding speciesism. So I'm indebted to all of these studies listed here because they really helped me in positioning where speciesism is within this dialogue. So I'll review a few key pieces here and just to um, kind of explain why um, given that they're fantastic, why they don't quite capture speciesism and why we need something new for that. So there are instruments that incorporate anthropocentrism, which deals with the superiority and privileges of humans, but that's related to nature. Non-human animals are incorporated as a piece of nature rather than kind of these beings within their own right. Now, um, we have Templer and colleagues who worked on the perceived continuity between non-humans and humans. And while that is really, really interesting and may correlate with speciesism, it doesn't quite um, focus on privilege and superiority. It's more about whether there's this dichotomous distinction between groups. Similarly, we have Taylor and Signal, Knight and colleagues, Henry and Dr. Herzog, who I know is here, um, who developed very similar instruments exploring different attitudes related to non-human animals, all of which are incredibly helpful in piecing together speciesism. So their main limitation with respect to speciesism is that they don't, in all cases, address attitudes and behaviors across all species of non-human animals, and also incorporate general underlying beliefs about superiority and privilege, which is really what speciesism is about. So to fill in the gap, here is the speciesism scale. Um, items were uh, originally developed just based on a review of the literature. There was a panel of people sort of rating items for clarity, relevance, that kind of thing. So we put together a big instrument that way. That was their initial draft. And then participants were recruited um, online to complete a survey. The survey included the original draft of the speciesism scale, the animal attitude scale to measure convergent validity, since it was believed that those topics really overlap in some fundamental ways. The satisfaction with life scale, which I suppose had nothing at all to do with speciesism, because I assume that you could be highly speciesist and still very happy with your life. So that was used to measure divergent validity. And then a brief demographic questionnaire. 400 participants completed the survey. They all resided in the United States, and they were between age 18 and 84. I'm pretty sure the 84-year-old was my grandfather, but I can't be quite sure since it was anonymous. Um, gender, 60% women, 40% men. These are all sort of demographics that just describe the sample. I won't go into detail here, but I'll discuss them a bit more in uh, a few slides. Um, here are some more participant demographics, education, political affiliation, religion, dietary practices, that kind of thing. All that are supposed to be relevant for speciesism, so I'll describe all of those in a little bit. So after collecting the data, some, uh, all of the items were evaluated just to determine whether or not they contributed to this, this um, idea of speciesism or not. So a bunch of them were removed in the first step um, based on analyses, and then a factor analysis was conducted. It was a principal components analysis with oblique rotation. Since it was assumed that the factors would kind of overlap with each other, they weren't entirely distinct. Um, items that didn't load onto any factor were removed, and the remaining items yielded six factors. Um, I'll talk about those factors in just a moment. Now, each factor evidenced um, good internal consistency in and of itself, but the first factor accounted for a lot of the variance, whereas two through six counted for comparatively little. So it's really not separate useful scales that are here. This is kind of one big instrument. Now the final, final speciesism scale is a 33 item instrument. I think it started at 105 or something unreasonably long that nobody in their right mind would want to take again. So um, all items were scored on a four point Likert type scale, some were reverse scored. High scores indicate higher levels of speciesism, low scores lower levels of speciesism. And the six factors in order of the variance for which they account, so in order of the factors <laughs> listed before, were these. Experimentation, 
food and clothing, power and law, general superiority, recreation and ornamentation, and property and domestication. Now some of these factors exist within other instruments. Some of them are new, some of them are very different. And I think the pieces that are especially relevant in an understanding of speciesism that are missing from other instruments are power and law and general superiority. That kind of gets at that superiority and privilege that isn't there in a lot of general attitudes towards animal instruments. Normal distribution range, so um, the subsequent analyses were valid. So Chromeback's alpha for all 33 items was really, really strong. So that means good internal consistency and instrument reliability. Here are some other kind of fun facts about the instrument. Nothing very interesting, though. Now, Pearson's R between the speciesism scale and the animal attitude scale was 0.93. So that's a really, really strong correlation. Higher levels of speciesism correlate with less favorable attitudes towards non-human animals. Now, um, that correlation is really interesting because it's so strong, one might wonder, are these really measuring the exact same thing? And that's a good question, and it's something to evaluate in the future. I'm curious about that. I think speciesism fundamentally differs from attitudes towards animals, but we need to figure that out. Now, the Pearsons are computed between the speciesism scale and the satisfaction with life scale scores was a non-significant negative correlation, so good divergent validity with that. Here are a bunch of non-significant group comparisons. So um, that included country of birth, community of residence, ethnicity, education level, income. Some limitations are pretty important to note here, though, with respect to um, country of birth, pretty much everyone was born in the United States, so that's not a really good piece of information to look at here. Um, with respect to community of residence, some studies have found that community of residence does impact ideas about other animals, so I'm not sure if that differs with speciesism or if this is kind of a, a skewness of the sample. With eth ethnicity, most of the participants were Caucasian, so this needs to be tested with a more diverse ethnic group to figure out if these really um, the, the information gathered from the study really applies to other ethnic groups or if there are differences between those groups. Um, highest level of education, the sample was pretty highly educated. It was spread out pretty well across categories but tended towards the highly educated, so I wonder if less educated participants might evidence a different scoring pattern. And um, also, the weak correlation between speciesism and income might be stronger with the inclusion of a greater number of low-income participants, especially since the general pattern found in previous studies suggests that um, income and attitudes towards non-human animals are related. So it's possible that the income finding may relate to age, since um, younger participants tended to have lower incomes. Thanks. So there we go. Some significant correlations were found between the species and scale and demographics. Gender was found to be significant. Women scored significantly lower on speciesism than did men. And that correlates well with other studies that have found a similar scoring pattern amongst genders. Um, oh, age as well. Age was found to significantly correlate with speciesism with younger participants scoring lower on speciesism. Um, let's see. Dietary practice. Significant differences were found there. Post hoc comparisons revealed that vegans scored significantly lower than omnivores, pescatarians, vegetarians, and omnivores with vegetarian efforts. They sort of classified themselves. We all put themselves within other and then made sure to say, you know, I, I'm vegetarian a little bit at the time. So, um, so I made them a group. And then vegetarians, pescatarians, and omnivores with vegetarian efforts scored significantly lower than omnivores. So it appears that those who consume fewer animal products within their diets also are lower on speciesism. There was also um, omnivore with ethical considerations. They sort of made clear that um, they're omnivores, but they, they really care about certain ethics related to eating. So that category had to be created as well. Now, both political affiliation and religious affilia affiliation failed to meet the assumption of homogeneity of variances for one-way ANOVAs, so um, these tests were conducted. Now, um, we can see that according to political party groups, these are all US political parties, so 
Those affiliated with the Green Party scored lower than Democrats, Independents, Republicans, and those with no political affiliation at all. And Democrats and Independents, God, thank you, um, scored lower than Republicans. With religious affiliation, spiritual people scored lower than Catholics and Protestants, and those with no religious affiliation scored lower than Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. Now, for current applications, um, wow, I'm a lot further along than I realized. I thought I'd have to race through the last couple of slides. So, um, current applications. This seems to be a more inclusive self-report measure of the relationships between humans and non-human animals. It seems useful for labeling, understanding, measuring and tracking speciesism as a multifaceted construct that really gets at the superiority and privilege associated with isms, with the prejudice involved in this. Limitations, there are some major limitations and some really important opportunities for future research. I'm hoping that this can be utilized with studies that are more representative in terms of um, ethnic categories, geographical groups, cultural groups, and political diversity. And it's also important to evaluate the consistency of the self-report measure with observable practical applications of these behaviors, since you know self-report's always gonna be a bit limited. And um, that's it, thank you. Feel free to contact me if you'd like more information. I don't like talking on the phone, but my email's easy to get to. And uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. I guess we'll open it up for questions.